Alexandra Boyd. This How is me. are you? I'm very good, thank you. Great, great stuff. Um, thank you so much for talking to Baylorick TV. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. Okay, so The Wilderness. Yes. You are the producer or director? I am both, and I am, I've written it as well. We found oh. this story about two years ago. My producing partner was working for the Olympics, which, as you everyone knows, were in London last summer. Mm-hmm. So the East End of London was going to benefit from the Olympic Park being built there. And while um, John Pettigrew, my producing partner, was working for LOCOG, he discovered this story about a champion boxer, Harry Mallon, who won Olympic gold in 1920 and 1924. He was the first Olympian to win in two consecutive games. And his mentor, the, the man who created the Eaton Manor Boys Club, was an old Etonian called Arthur Villas. So John found this story and he just thought, why does nobody know that before Sebastian Coe and the legacy of the Olympics, that 100 years ago, it was going on right where the Olympics were about to happen? Wow. So he, he uncovered this story. We, we shot a short film that very much outlined in a sketch the idea of a, a guy from a very privileged um, uh, and highly educated background would move to the East End. And literally build a house there and spend his whole life uh, being the benefactor to this boys club. And then out of it came a champion boxer. Um, Unfortunately, the club's not there anymore, but it follows the pattern of all these boys clubs that takes young people off the streets and gives them, whether it's boxing or rugby, cricket, Mm. football, David Beckham played on The Wilderness. The, the film is called The Wilderness because the Hackney Marshes were known as The Wilderness. There was wow, nothing I, there. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't even know that. I've, uh, I used to go to school in East London. I was, yep. born, I, was, I was brought up in Forest Gate, although I was born in Hackney. So there's, uh, And I know Eton Manor because I used to play cricket at Eton Manor. Really? Yeah, so I know Eton Manor from there. We used to live in Forest Gate, but it was Waltham Forest. It wasn't far off. Yes, yeah, well, and Hackney Wick is is really the centre, the community I have, you know, we've expanded the, the story, the true story, into a full screenplay. So I have built, you know, a sort of fictional community of boys and their families and the baddies and the coach and, you know, Arthur Villas and Harry Mallon are in there, but I've created this one, what I, you know, I've affectionately just completely absorbed in this East End community. And then the juxtaposition is the what I call the cross-pollination of the Etonians, of the Eton schoolboys, who would come to Hackney and they would play, they would have tournaments and sport and wow. they'd play each other. And then the boys from Eton Manor would go to Eton and they would row on the river there. And, you know, so so it was a it was a very much a how the other half lives. Lives. Yes. Yeah, we're a wow. sporting Downton Abbey, is what I like to think. <laughs> so, upstairs, downstairs, in the world of boxing. <laughs> people would ask the question to me, who's Alexandra Boyd? But I've looked at your Wikipedia, impressive. Yes. So, who is Alexandra Boyd as an actress? Well, as an actress, which is the thing I've done for most of my professional life, I, I started as a dancer, actually, in, uh, in London, and did a few pantos and realized that was too much like hard work. So I went to drama school and uh, started a, a, a theater company. Um, but then very, quite soon after that, I moved to the States. I was married to an American that I met in the UK. His job took us back to the States. Um, and I ended up over 17 years living in about four or five different states in the United States and typically ending up in Los Angeles. So in my 10 years in Hollywood, um, literally, it, it always feels strange. Where did you live in L.A.? Oh, I lived in Hollywood. There is a, there is a place called Hollywood. called Hollywood. The neighborhood is called Hollywood. Um, and I, I did 10 years there, you know, had a wonderful time, worked with some of the top people in the business. James Cameron cast me in Titanic. I worked with Richard Dreyfuss in uh, Mr. Holland's Opus. That was the first feature film I did. It was just a wonderful experience. Did a lot of commercials, a lot of voiceovers. And then I just, I realized one day when I was driving along the streets with the sun shining and the palm trees and I just realized I wanted to come home. 
so I sort of began, I had a sort of a, it wasn't quite my road to Damascus, but I had this sort of moment that I, it was probably time to come back to London. So, um, and I, you know, you're an expat where you live. There's a, there's a huge transition <laughs> yes. that occurs. Having the idea and finding the wherewithal to move is one thing, but it kind of takes about two years to resettle, even when you're going home. Absolutely. So, um, but within two years, almost to the day of flying back here, I got um, a fabulous part on Coronation Street. And I was on Coronation Street for six months playing a sort of, sassy gobby sexy rich wife of a rich guy and had cat fights in the rovers and you know all this sort of stuff great fun um and then when that finished um not long after i began writing i wrote a short film we tried to raise some money for that and then that crossed over with john finding the the harry mallon story and and two years later here we are Wow, wow. So in terms of your connection to the boxing community, do you like boxing? I do. But I get, of course, I get that question all the time now. So are you a boxing fan? Mm. And I was not, I'll be right, I was not a boxing fan before I started this project. And there was, I'm not really a sports fan. Although I, when I count it up, I played a lot of sports, Mm. but I'm not an athlete. Like I, Road in a ladies eight. I played polo a long time ago, right. about 25 years ago. My ex husband and I had polo ponies. So I've rode, I've played polo, I've, uh, you know, just all, done all these. And then I started to learn to box because I figured if I was going to direct actors to box, I've got to have a clue What's about the on? physicality of it and the emotion of it. So, so when I talk to boxers, especially the champion boxers who've, who've worked so incredibly hard to, to attain and then maintain champion status, there's a very similar parallel to acting. Absolutely. And, and, and the drive and the people telling you, you know, how hard you've got to work or it's very competitive, you know. Oh, really? I didn't notice all these other actors in the world I have to compete Eat against. With. Like, yes. you know, state the obvious, why don't you? So, so the, you know, so the more I speak to, to boxers and the more I go to boxing matches, for me, I think I don't, I can't call myself a boxing fan because I'm coming from it from the psychology and the emotion mm. and the, how you sustain that. And what drove you to be a boxer? What 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 keeps you being a boxer? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it because you you came from the streets? Are you doing it because you've got some? Who knows? Every story is different, different. slightly different, but they yeah. they kind of have a common, a common starting point, and then obviously a common goal. Mm-hmm. And um, and and you know, I talk to some of my friends who are movie stars, and it's kind of lonely at the top there. You know, it's not yes. not necessarily an enviable enviable place, place to, to be. be. And imagine. when I one of the first champions I got to speak to was Lennox Lewis, okay. and I said, what I see is that you're an amateur kid boxer. You do really well. You start going up the ladder. You get an Olympic gold medal and everyone's like, yay, Olympic gold medal. And then all of a sudden everything turns because all these people around you see that they can make a chunk of money out of you being a professional boxer. And all Lennox did was he's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you know the, it's, the story is the same. The minute you become an A-list actor because, you know, you won the gene pool lottery and you're quite talented. So you look fabulous and you can do a bit of acting and you can cry on cue and you get a movie that could be the equivalent of your Olympic gold medal. Yeah. And all of a sudden everybody wants a piece of you. It's interesting because the the whole Bay Loric, the whole theme, I'll tell you a little bit about Bay Loric yes. and then come straight back into your point. The whole thing about Bay Loric, it's about, it was, I used to coach, I coached cricket, but it was about creating champions on and off the field. So when we've yes. gone to doing Bay Loric worldwide and now doing the TV and the audio shows, it's about talking to champions, how they've got to the top, what it's taken for them to get to the top, but not just in boxing. Um, you know, in in the music industry, in entertainment, yep. 
So and there yeah. is a common thread. I started young. I, you know, I, I, some people didn't want me to do what I did, but I stuck at it. You know, I overcame various issues and you know, it's the common thread. And then the yes. challenges, the challenge of to face and then becoming that champion and then maintaining that championship form, which yes. sometimes is even harder than actually getting to the top. Yes. It's a different type I, I, of battle. I, think, I don't think it is sometimes. I think it always is. Mm. And it always it's, is. It's a different battle because now you're battling against staying at the top and watching other people trying to pull you back down. Oh, yes. In, in a process, you know. So it's a different battle. How do you how do you deal with critics? Because boxers have to deal with criticism. How do you deal with criticism? Oh. <laughs> I, I have to say... Um, like the only real critique I've had is in um, newspaper reviews of, say, plays I've been in. Oh, yes. And um, a, a long time ago, somebody said, just don't read the reviews until you finish the play. Because what you'll do is you'll try and tailor your performance to what one person said. And, you know, and what's also very easy to do is that. You know, you might get one bit of criticism. All your friends like, oh, my God, you're amazing. You made me laugh so hard. I cried at this bit. You, you ignore all of that, all of your close friends and family who want to support you. And you let one punk who kind of sits there, comes to plays or goes to movies and thinks they have, you know, they have a platform. So they get to write about you. But it's one person that you may never meet. So, so now what I do is I just sort of read them and I go, oh, that's kind of an interesting point of view. You know, have you ever been in a play? Have you ever made a movie? You know, have you ever done this or that? And a lot of, a lot of critics, you know, I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not knocking the critics either. <laughs> but <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, it's, it's, it, yeah, and also it comes with being older and more experienced and knowing that I can do a good job. And actually, sometimes you don't hit the sweet spot, but you gave it a bloody good try, you know. So, so to take it personally, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't do that anymore. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 one, used review, to. I one review of a play I did with, it was just me and another guy. We were a married okay. couple. Okay. And it said, um, Alexandra and the actor who shall name re remain nameless, um, <laughs> looked like there was so little chemistry between them. It looked like they rehearsed on the telephone. Oh, I think that's quite funny. Well, it is quite funny. But <laughs> after you put a lot of hard work into something, you know, you always get one person that comes out and Jacko yeah. Fox and makes these comments, you know. So, but I guess they... If you use if you use their criticism in the right way, they make us they they make us work harder and and achieve more and yes the driving yes. force motivating factors exactly exactly and um, you know you can't uh, I'm getting criticism or I'm getting feedback on my uh, script already you know it's got too much of this or you missed the point on that or you know you can't make it too sentimental. And um, and I had one dear dear friend of a long time of a you know I really value her opinion and mm. have done for many years, and she started sort of doing making her her personal list of what didn't work for her in the in the story, and I banged the table. I said, I can't make a movie just for you. Mm. I'm making a movie for the whole world. Now I mean this sounds terribly grandiose. I'm making a movie for 25-year-old girls. There's a love story between an Eton boy and an Eton, and you know, an Eton manor, excuse me, an Eton boy and an Eton manor girl, mm. like, you know, Romeo and Juliet. They come from, you know, a cross-class love affair. Nobody approves. So I've got the 25-year-old female dating markets covered. I've got the boxes covered. I've got the war historians. I've got this theme, you know, that we all go to the movies for. We see a character that we love and we see him get put through the mill and we want to see how he overcomes every obstacle put in his way. And a lot of people, some people don't want to see that movie. They think it's too... It, it, you know, the Hollywood ending isn't for them. They want to see what I call movies to slit your wrists by. And I'm not making a movie to slit your wrists by. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of wilderness and it's a boxing movie, 
Yes. And apart from talking to Lennox Lewis, who else have you got involved with this project in terms of getting the advice or even contacting them through Twitter or Facebook? Who have you really got involved so far with it? Um, well, as far as boxers, yes. uh, I've spoken to Anthony Joshua, okay. who won the heavyweight uh, Olympic gold. Yes. Um, and in fact, he's, a, he's something of a hero of mine because that day that Britain won won three gold medals and a, and a bronze as well, I think. But it was a big day for British boxing. Mm. And um, we had been, I had been sort of courting um, a studio, um, a big studio that you will have heard of. And I kept emailing and linked in to this one guy who is, you know, part of the movers and shakers of that studio. And the day after Anthony, well, Joshua, as his friends call him, Joshua and all those those uh, kids, including Nicola Adams, won wow. those gold medals. I got an email from him saying, "Can I read your script, please? Given the fact that you're you've written a movie about British boxing, a British boxing Olympian, I think it's time I read your script." And we are now, you know, they've got us on a, what they call a watching brief, which means, you know, when as you as you go along, as the story of the production of the film moves along, we want to. We want to know how you're doing. Wow. So it, again, it cross references all the way. The the the, you know, the London Olympics were were huge for us. So when I met when I met Joshua, there was an amazing photograph in the Daily Mail of him. It was an aerial shot of him just having left hooked this Italian opponent, and it's the most beautiful photograph in and of itself. And I had it on my desktop. I didn't do it to impress him. It was just on the on the wallpaper of my iPad. And I said, what was going through your head when you threw that punch? He's like, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to win. But uh, so, you know, that this sort of the art and the art of the sport are very much crossover. Spoken to Barry McGuigan. Wow. Barry's really interesting because he trained Daniel Day-Lewis in a Jim Sheridan film called The Boxer. Yes. And um, we talked a lot about, um, well, the psychology of an actor like Daniel Day-Lewis, who, you know, is just brilliant in everything he does and absorbs it, you know, throws himself and, you know, becomes the character. And uh, Barry was talking about how uh, he, he, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis would actually Spar. He wanted to have the whole experience. And uh, at the same time, Denzel Washington was training for um, the hurricane. Yes. But Denzel had done a bit of sparring and it given him his he given him a headache. So he decided he didn't know he need to go that far. But but Daniel Day Lewis was, you know, he, he he became a boxer. He he became a boxer. Um wow. you know, and it's it's been and then oh an Ethan Manor uh boy boxer in his seventies now is um Nicky Gagano. He he was um Olympian nineteen fifty six. Okay. And um, he came home with a bronze, and I think um, I think he should have got the gold. But the, you know, the the um, the story, whether it's apocryphal or not, is that we had already the Britain had already won two gold medals, and they pulled him aside before his bout and said, "You won't, we won't get another gold. You're going to have to go be happy with silver or bronze." And indeed, he took the bronze, and he came home, and he he never fought again. He just wow. said, "Right." And you just, you see it, you know, you see these old boxers never die. They just, they retire earlier than most of us in our career. Mm. And, you know, the, the glory days are very important to them. And, and as they should be, I mean, as they should be, you know, I'm an actress. I can still be acting when I'm 80, but you, you can't be a boxer when you're 80. You know, no, you shouldn't can't. be. But, uh, no. but uh, Berta Hopkins is doing a good job at 48. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wince then because I'm older than that, and I'm like, I I can barely do ten in a row, and then a double jab like that, and I'm bright red in the face, and all my every corpuscle in my body. I come out and I'm like this. I'm like, no photographs, please. I'm unrecognizable <laughs> after an hour of just pad work. I can't, I can't imagine. But then I'm a girl as well. I'm a girl. So. Boxer, boxer wants to talk to me. Um, I I love it. I just I get so. I have warm, fuzzy feelings whenever I, whenever, in, in, in the correct way, when I speak. <laughs>
<laughs> well, because this, well, listen, I'm bringing it back to your common thread. It's the yes. common thread of determination. And, you know, I'm, I'm now transferring everything I've learned as an actress in, in the business side of it, in the profession, in the mindset side of it to this, to this film, because, you know, the, the, my industry, the film industry is very risk averse. And they don't they don't want a first time director. They want a director who's delivered a film before. They don't want, you know, it, it's all right. The script is OK because the script is done. Um, and, you know, my passion for the story and my confidence in my ability to make the story come to fruition, you know, in the f form of a feature film. You know, there, there are lots of obstacles in my way. Forget the money. You know, it's it's changing people's opinions about you know even female directors even though it's kind of a nice subject with Catherine Bigelow winning the Oscar a couple of years ago you know women are not perceived to be you don't you know they say female film director when it's a guy it's just the director yes I oh, female boxer female boxer Nicola Adams yes why not just boxer Nicola Adams she's always female boxer uh, I'm afraid that 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 is for a while. For a while. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm a I'm an advocate. For, I don't know how you feel about women's boxing, but I'm an advocate for I I do like women's boxing. It's a shame it's not on TV as much. Um, I was a fan of it back in the day. Yourself, your thoughts? Uh, uh women boxing. Um, well, I think it's all part of um female empowerment, which again sounds terribly grandiose. I know. <laughs> Spice Girls. Yeah, well, Girl you know, it's, it's, but it's gone a bit. You know, we still have mm. we still have a lot of work to do, yep. and there's a you know the women's movement. You know, fifty, sixty odd years ago, sort of, sort of didn't do us any favors. We still want to be feminine. We still want to be strong, and we still want to have opinions. And God forbid, I should not be allowed to voice my opinion. Um, <laughs> it's 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 still you know, it, it's still uh, a, a struggle. So if, so for instance, if a woman chooses a sport that's not tennis, but is boxing, there's probably going to be a reason behind that too. Yes. That, and if she excels at boxing, there's going to be a mindset because she's, remember, she's boxing another woman. It's not like she's in there with, with a, a six foot, you know, 250 pound guy. So, so there's an evenness there. And I guess it's just the question of whether something that's even controlled violence is, uh, is appropriately feminine. I think, I think I'm going to, I'm going to leave my jury out on that because I don't, I don't know, okay. but I certainly think that there's no harm in what Nicola Adams represents as a champion female. Okay. Fair enough. How, in, in, in your eyes, what do you think it's going to take for this movie to be taken seriously? Because uh, they're saying, well, well, she's female, it's Alexandra Boyd, oh, well, well, you know, it's not one of the big, well-known directors. What do you think it will take, not only for, for people to bite it and say, yeah, we want this, but for it to actually be a hit? What do you think it's going to take? It's going to take um, a couple of things couple of three things um an a-list actor who responds to my script and says i want to be in this film and i waive my millions of dollars agent sit down you'll hold have that, to hold that thought there as you say that yeah now give me five a-list actors that you would want for, the, for for to be your top five my they, top five. Top what do you mean five. in the film or just top five A-list actors? <laughs> no, 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 no. Top five for this particular, for the wilderness. We're promoting the wilderness. The wilderness. Yeah. Okay. There's a part for James McAvoy. Do you know who he is? Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. There's a part for Be Still My Beating Heart, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Oh. Yes. Okay. Now, now, again, you have to remember that he's played a lot of fighters and boxers. You know, that's his persona. So whether he'd want to play Harry Mallon's older champion bare knuckle fighting brother, I don't know. But when and you do this, it's a very intelligent question because you do you do make a, a, a wish list, a fantasy cast list. And this helps finance people. They can see the actor and without 
you know, necessarily reading the script, they get a, a flavour of the time yeah. cut. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So for the coach, for the boys' coach and father figure, I would love Liam Neeson because he was a boxer himself in right. Ulster, amateur boys champion at 17. And he's of that age where he could be that father figure. He has that gravitas and and it's actually a lovely part because he sort of hands over the coaching of Harry to the hero. The hero, Charlie, can't, it's a spoiler alert. He, <laughs> don't, this is at the end of the film, but there's a moment, nobody will remember by the time the film comes out. But there's a moment when, he's, when the coach says to Charlie, oh, it's, it's not my job anymore, it's yours. You you help Harry. It's there you go. So so that so that all right. How many of it? How many have I? I've had three. You had three. Two, Two more. more. Can't ignore the women. Can't ignore the girls. The girls are very young. There's Charlie's wife, who's a bit of a wag, and she wants him to go professional so they can have a nice house and she can have nice hats. And uh, she's sort of you know she's aspirational and she doesn't stop having babies. So you know somebody like Lacey Turner from EastEnders. I don't know if your your yeah, listeners would know her. I know who she is. I know who she is. Yes, yes, Lacey yes. Turner. she'd be great. Um, and then there's the the young tomboyish sister who falls in love with the Etonian, and that could be somebody like Andrea Riseborough. She's she's just in a movie with Tom Cruise called Oblivion. Okay. And she was um, Wallace Simpson in Madonna's film W E. Okay. Right. So that's your five. That's a five. All right. So that's your five. If you had those five, you think the movie would be a hit? If I had, if I had one, if I had one, the movie would be a hit, and that would be Liam. One Newton. of them. Had- well, and more importantly, because of the way the business works, mm-hmm. having Liam Neeson because of his because, and they're called A list actors because I just put because we put them on the A list. Okay. And then you go through all them and then you go to your B list and your C list. Okay, let's not so, go B and C. Yeah, Let, not, let's leave B and C a, alone. Yeah, it's not a, um, it's not a, you know, it's it's a very valid thing. They're called A list because in the eyes of not just me as a producer and a director, but in the eyes of the industry, yes. the, the bankability of that actor lends kudos to the film. Do you, and, th- go on. Do you think that having A star boxers in your movie making cameo appearances or being in your movie would make any difference to you? Yeah. It makes a little bit of difference, yes. Okay. And I, I am in negotiations with okay. one champion boxer to play, to have a cameo, yes. Okay. I can't say who it is, though. No, 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 I don't, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm dying to, I'm dying to, but I can't, I can't tell you, can't tell you. Okay, well, I don't want you to die. You'll have to interview me wait, again. Wait, 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 wait. But if you say you're dying to, I don't want you dying. Tell me, and then you can die. <laughs> oh, but release the movie first. Then you can die. No, I can tell you when, when, when you know, yeah, it's obviously. like it's like all these promoters going, oh, you know, there's a big match coming up. We've got him. Yeah. Oh, we've got him over here. This one. And we want, well, we can't tell you who the other one is. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Because they haven't, they haven't, blooming well, got a match. So I have the, you know, the, and I, I, just, uh, I have him, but I, he hasn't, you know. Okay. Um, in terms of choreography and for throwing the punches and to do the boxing. Yes. Have you ever? Okay. Let me let me put it away. Let, let me ask you the question. So let me put the suggestion in. Who have you? Who will you be using for the choreography for the boxers? Yeah. Yes. A, a, an amazing, amazing. 25 years in the business stunt coordinator called Derek Lee. He is fantastic. He okay. he's done James Bond films. He he was the stoker in Titanic. You know when Kate and Leo are running through. Yes. They're running and they're they're putting the, the all the coal into the into the engines. Yes. He's the one who goes. Oh, you can't go down there. And that's Derek. So he plays parts, but he also he takes falls for A-list actors, A-list, for big movie stars. Okay. And he can we we've had many meetings with him talking about choreographing the fights in a vintage way too. Because even if I get an actor who's going to be training for two three months to get his physique going or training as a boxer, he does still have to modify 
his boxing style Two, four or hundred years ago. Yes, yeah, yes. Wow. You, you know, boxing is very yes, different. It is. You know, the gloves are different, you know. And in fact, uh, going back to going to my Kickstarter campaign where we're going to do this short film, this this teaser, this trailer, like a screen test, Derek is we're using two champion boxers. One of them is Darren Barker, who's former okay. Commonwealth uh, champion. Mm-hmm. Darren's like, anything to get the film made, I'll show up, I'll do this. You know, we, we have discussions about, well, they wore leather gloves, but Derek, the stunt guy, says, well, they, they even though we're, we're, it's, it's fake fighting, they will still connect. So we've got to take a real modern boxing glove and give it a leather skin so that it looks like an old style boxing glove. But it still has to have all that protection because they, they just had horse hair in these gloves before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they yeah, got yeah. heavy with sweat and they got. So I can't have my guy, my actors go for eight hours, uh, even if they're choreographed you know they've got to have proper gloves on um so so yes a lot of care and and rehearsal has to go and of course i look at darren and i go you know darren you don't get to hit the guy all day that's all right no no no, you can't hit it this is not a sparring session it is a you know it has to be it has to be managed in in you know by by professional and that's not me that's a guy like derek lee who whose job it is to um, make sure that people don't get hurt, but that it looks completely realistic. So where are things in terms of the actual release of the movie? Yeah, you, talk, you talked about the Kickstarter thing. Talk to me more about Kickstarter. Well, um, we came upon this idea. It's a very American format of crowd, crowdfunding is the big, big name for it. Mm-hmm. And um, the idea is that you say, look, I've got this project and I need a bit of cash for it. And you 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 lay it all out, and then in you know whether it's whether it's you know a tenner or twenty five quid or a hundred quid or you know you go up, and we as the project creators give a thank you, and it could be a t shirt, it could be a thanks in the credits, it could be we've got um, on our campaign we've got a visit to Abbey Road Studios, sit in the Beatles studio and have your photograph taken on the mixing desk and then lunch in the canteen and you know Abbey Road is like, you know, it's like it's like Fort Knox. You can't get in, you have to be invited. So, you know, we've got these great sort of money can't buy rewards. Um, another one is when we finish the short film, we're going to do a premiere at BAFTA, which is, you know, the Academy of the British yes. Academy Awards. So we, we will invite the people who bought that reward to BAFTA to see the film, you know. Um, so so you, you give thank yous, you give real, real tangible thank yous. Um, and, and the campaigns that are very successful, ironically, aren't the big, here's a 2,000 pounds, here's 1,500 pounds, here's 100 pounds. They are, ten, they are thousands of people giving a tenner. And... And I'm telling you, I have been tweeting every boxer I know, the ones I've met, the ones I'd like to meet, the ones I have found on Twitter. And bless their hearts, they are retweeting to their thousands of followers. But not one boxing fan has has stepped up to our campaign. What do you think that is? Hmm, interesting. Now, there's a few things, there's a few ideas. First of all, yeah. the boxers themselves. I think fans are very much... Not all of them, but fans follow what boxers do. If boxers say, all right, I'm going to contribute £10 or £100 or $100 towards this event, they see that. If the fighter does that, the fans follow suit. So, for example, if David Hay said, yeah, I support this, he turns up, puts his money in, says, all right, I'll put some money towards it, fans will follow because they like David Hay. Yes. But you can retweet all, retweet all you want. You just put the retweet button. Is that making somebody commit? No. It's showing loyalty because that fighter has pressed, said, press retweet. So I've pressed retweet. Now, if that fighter will turn and say, here's the link, go and donate money to, like I have, and maybe you've got a photograph of that person donating that money, that may spin and may get more fight fans involved. Another thing is, with, with the world of Google Hangout and videos we've got here and, and audio, to be able to do a, a situation, here's your opportunity to be a part of 
the wilderness. And, yes. you know, that's another way of... Um, it, it's, it's suggestions, but... Uh, you know, well, and, and, I, and, I, and I think you're absolutely right. And that, so, so as, as much of a, a connection as we do have to the professional boxing world, I do think uh, it goes back to us being an unproven entity. Well, yeah. So if I was Steven Spielberg mm. showing up to a press conference or to a training gym, or I was, mm. you know, or somebody was, and so, you know, you, um, you know, that it's just, it's making those connections and getting that, that boxer to do that. And, and um, submerging yourself in the boxing community, literally being I was, there. I was just at a Frank Warren press conference this very day. Ah, but, there we go. And, Big match at Wembley with um, Derek Nathan Chizora Cleverley and, Nathan and Cleverley. Uh, yeah. Derek Chisora and uh, oh yeah, I I get I'll get a bat. Don't worry, I'll get a bat. <laughs> get in <laughs> there, it, love. It's get in there. It's not an overnight thing, you know. It's um, you know, I, I it's it's very interesting, and I love, and I'm always the only woman in the room, so it you know I don't go unnoticed. Mm. So yo, well yes, well just submerge yourself in that and 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 reach out to those people as well and uh get yourself on steve bunce's boxing hour all right you, right. Why you got his phone in you got his phone number but oh no i haven't sorry <laughs> but I, yeah, look i'm on your program i've just been interviewed by the telegraph i'm you know i was just on um a talk uh boxing radio show in um new york BillyCsBoxing.com, I think it is. And I also was interviewed by the Hollywood MMA radio talk show. So, you know, I'm getting lots of opportunity to talk about it. And I don't expect people to respond in the first instance. It has to be, there's that woman again talking about boxing. What is she whinging on about now? And it may be the second or the third time or whatever, you know. Well, on my side of things, I love, I love the sport boxing first and foremost. Um, and I will do what I can from my side in terms of getting some sort of connections going for you as well. From my side, of things, um, ATG Radio is probably one you could probably get you on, get you get you uh, talking to them. It's yes. a leading uh, boxing radio station. It's got quite a few listeners. So ATG yes. Jenna, get all the top things, leave it in the rings another. Um, Jenna, Jenna J um, on the ropes boxing. She's uh, one of the very few females out there doing yes. her thing. She's doing it for many years. Uh, interviewed some of the best fighters in the world, past, present, and potentially future. So yes. Jenna would be perfect for you to talk to as well. Yes, I think. I think um, I just started following her on Twitter, so I yeah, certainly. So, so Jenna, Jenna would be perfect uh, to to talk to as well. Um, in the UK, there's so many people that are doing boxing. YouTube, YouTube's uh, a community. YouTube community is one which yes. is. Um, I, I film. I film. I film, of course. Well, yeah. Cassius, I film under, yes. Yeah. Cassius, but yeah, the, the YouTube community is one that's very much untapped. And um, when somebody can actually, in terms of boxing, when somebody can tap and capitalize on a boxing community, which I think you've got the perfect opportunity to do. Yes. Um, I think that's well, going to. Maybe I need to take my own little video camera to these press conferences and wait till the end and go, can I just have 30 seconds? And then we put it on our, you know, we do have a YouTube channel. We just started it with with the short film, the six minute short film. Um, so we can start posting, you know, all our moments. It's, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's also fun as well. It's not, you know, these things don't, you know, when, when you hear, and I, please trust me, I'm not gonna be talking about this in 10 years time, but Rocky did take Sylvester Stallone 10 years to bring to the screen because he wanted to act in it. He wanted to play the boxer. And in a similar way, I face that same challenge because I'm determined to direct my film. And I won't, I won't cling on to it for dear life, but I, I, you know, I, for now I am the director of this film and it's, it's one of the potential stumbling blocks. And I just have to ignore that and keep going just like Sylvester Stallone did. Uh, in regards to Sylvester Stallone, have you reached out to him? I, I met him his brother. I met his brother. Ah. His, his Christian name escapes me. Frank. Frank. Frank yeah, I, 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 I had lunch with that. him in in Los Angeles last right. year, right. and um, and again, it was like uh, the the person who introduced us said, "You should meet the director. She's here in LA right now." He's like, "She? It's a her." 
so that was, you know, a good start. But honestly, he was a complete gentleman. He's a fanatic about vintage boxing, but mostly American, obviously, okay. you know, of course. And he, he collects memorabilia and he knows about the history of a lot of American boxers. And I think that was, you know, the initial reason why the person who introduced us thought we should get together. Um, so so I'm, I've been one degree of separation away from, from Sylvester Stiller. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, um, and, and he's an actor too. Frank is an actor yes. as well. But unfortunately, there's not a part for Frank Stallone in the wilderness. So, you know, unless he can do a Cockney accent. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. have to work on his there, Cockney. Yeah. There's a point. Um, being a British movie. Yes. And not being in America. Yes. Is that a problem? Because you had Rocky and a few other boxing movies, Million Dollar and Babe and all the rest of them. Is that going to be a stumbling block or a problem because you're trying to base it in the UK? And obviously it's a UK story as opposed to an American story. Um, I don't think so at all. I, I think, think the very fact that there hasn't been a British boxing film of this size and this sort of global reach, I don't think so at all. And I think one thing that um, always sort of gets my goat here in in London is like how people say there's no film industry here and, and we don't have the money and it all goes to Hollywood and all this kind of stuff. But they are failing to recognize that every year at the Oscars, we sweep all the categories. We get, if we don't win, we, we always get a nomination nod. And you look at the amount of movies and movie makers from Hollywood who come to the UK to make their films because we have the craftspeople here to make, especially, you know, I'm talking, you know, real nuts and bolts filmmakers like cinematographers and and crew and, and lighting and grips and with two or three huge big studios that can handle these big movies. And um, And they, you know, Hollywood comes here so that, you know, there's an amazing resource here. So for my producing partner and I to be able to tap into that right on our doorstep, and I just, it, you know, being British, being a British story is actually a plus. Um, people, you know, often scratch their heads a bit when I say, we're like the King's speech. If you look at the parallels, we're about the same, um, about the same budget, about the, we'll spend about the same amount, it's based on a true story. It's um, it's about a guy from Australia teaching the king. So there's your cross class. You know, Jeffrey Rush kind of has that tongue in cheek. I don't care who you are. You've got a problem. I'm going to help you. You've got you've got vintage. You've got period film, which is not everybody's cup of tea. But I will tell you, the Americans love it. Why do they love Downton Abbey? Why do they love? Why do they love the King's Speech? We call it British movie pornography for the Americans. <laughs> you know, the architecture and the costumes and yeah. the accents. And so they love all that stuff. So you think? So I, yes, I think we are. Fit, I think we are sort of fitting into that, into that, into that um, place in the film market. So um, I think being British, being based on a true story, being an Olympic story that ties into you know, the Olympics of last year. And, you know, we hope to release next November, so 2014, which will be midway between London and Rio. So we'll have, you know, London will, will be a pleasant, nostalgic memory and Rio will be the, the Olympics everybody is looking, looking forward, forward to. to. So, why? I mean, again, this is where I, I don't know much about how a movie's made. Why does it take from now until november next year to wait for such a good movie um uh, just well just the logistics of making yes. it yeah yeah um oh gosh well you you spent when you get them up let, let's hypothetically let's imagine somebody wrote me a check right now it's on my table here right now and i've i've sorry ingham i've got to get to the bank before it closes so i right. can put my, my check in so if we started, if we were a go today, you spend about two and a half, three months in pre-production, which is just literally talking about how you're going to make it, who you're going to hire, where you're going to shoot it, getting all those 
spending all of that money, starting to spend that money. And then you have principal photography, which would be about 10 to 12 weeks. And then you would spend another 10 to 12 weeks in the editing suite, putting the music in, putting the sound, you know, all the elements that make it this full, rounded, two-hour piece of movie. And then you get going with selling it. And, you, and, and sometimes you can spend as much money on the, 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 the advertising and the, the promotion and advertising as you can on actually making the movie itself. There's no point making a beautiful, dramatic movie with lovely actors in it doing the, the best acting you ever saw. And nobody comes to see it because you didn't tell anybody about it. So, you know, these movie junkets, all the E entertainment, television, all the all the press, all the everything, you have to start generating that buzz. And then you do screenings that are not for the public, therefore press, therefore feedback, therefore, you know, all the stuff. And and then you choose when you we are choosing Remembrance Day of next year because of the first world war element we want to next year in the UK and Europe is going to be there'll be lots of memorials because it's the 100 year anniversary of the start of the first world war so so by the t if we started tomorrow we'd have a little bit of time in hand to relax have a cigarette i don't smoke glass of wine and go wait for wait for the premiere <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, and that's what a well-crafted movie that you want to hit those sweet spots, that, that's how long it takes. It's so a very valid question. What, what, what would it be like? I'm an A-lister. I'm the A-lister now. You're talking to A-list. You're trying to get me who to would you, Who do you want to be? Do you want to be Denzel Washington? I'm, um, 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 who do you want to be? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be the rock for this one. I'm going to be Dwayne Johnson. All right? Okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. right. Right, what? I'm, I'm there. <laughs> why would I why would I want to be a part of the wilderness? Right, so now now you're gonna ask now I'm gonna now put myself in the position of an actor. I I No just... no no tell you what, no 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 I can't be Dwayne Johnson. I'm gonna be oh. James Clo I'm gonna be uh, Clooney. He's got a good George Clooney? George Clooney, well, yeah. You could be in my movie if you were George Clooney like that. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you have to give me your phone number. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> fine. Fine. So, what, what? 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 What is it? Why should I be a part of your movie? Yeah, and you know what? I know what the answer is to this because I've asked it, and I've, you know, I, I would answer it the same way myself as an actor. It would be the story. It would be the story and the highs and the lows. And if I'm playing this one part, do I get to stretch myself emotionally? Certainly, the young boys playing the two boxers will stretch themselves emotionally and physically. That's a fantastic challenge for an actor. Um, you know, and then and then if you consider that there are lots of other supporting roles, if you're invited to be one of the supporting actors, you get to be part of this 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 organic machine that tells this story about this community in the East End and how it's transformed by a boys' club and and how one of them rose out of out of the ranks to be a champion and how the boys that came up after him emulated him and wanted to be like Harry Mallon and um and actors just actors just love that stuff they love it and and you know the based on a true story part you can't you can't beat that no, you, can't you can't beat that absolutely how how do you think again we're going to go back to the male chauvinist world how yes. do you feel as a director and a new director, how are you going to deal with the issues of having to direct men who may have a problem taking orders from a woman in such a sport? Yeah, well, and that's and that's an interesting. And of course, I've already sort of had a go at it with the short film. Yes, <laughs> had a bit of a go, and it was. <laughs> um, and also, also, what I think is interesting is that because I'm a woman. Mm. I mean, I can be one of the lads if I need to. Um, I can sort of hold my own ground. But one thing a direct, a singular thing a director needs, I believe, whether you're male or female, is a is a vision. 
is, is I've got all these pictures going that knock around in my head. There, there's sometimes there's sounds and music. I make playlists of movie music, or I, you know, I I have dialogue in my head because I've written the scene, and I wake up in the and I go and I go back into the script and I rewrite that scene because it kind of came out a bit better. My, but I've got all these images, all these pictures that I want to turn into moving pictures, and my job is to communicate to a cinematographer, he's the most important person to me, before the actors, believe it or not, I have to communicate to him how I want this particular moment to look. Mm. And then I'll go and walk over and talk to the actors and we'll get the scene going. So I'm, I'm, I'm confident that I'm very good at that. And I've done it in meetings I've done it and I've had cinematographers or I've had um, music people say do you know how clear your vision is and I'm like well to me it's no 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 we have directors sit right where you're sitting and you go do you mean like this and they go "Mm, no oh okay how or do you could you tell us how you would like it to be and it's 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 not always easy for directors to communicate and as you can tell from the last 45 minutes of us talking, I have no problem in communicating. <laughs> That's a nice answer. I, it's, I, just, I, it's just I have to get people to listen. That's the but, thing. I, but the thing is, the reason why I ask these questions is because you never know who listens to these interviews. So I'm trying to throw it out there as if I were an A-lister, as if I, yes. if I were a boxer, as if I were yes. a, one of the paying public, if I were somebody who's going to put a pledge in those are the certain yes. roles i'm playing at the moment yes so I'm trying to fizz- brilliant. you can be in the film i'm, in- I'm not I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not feeling you as a as a director um now as a coach for you to be able to impart knowledge or wisdom or to make something happen it's helpful when you've got um students that are a willing to learn and go the extra mile you can have all the a listers you want in the world, but being able to be able to impart that vision that you have to make that movie happen is obviously a, a, another challenge altogether. It, it is, and and you can never going back to the process of what it yes, takes to yes. make the film. You can never be too prepared. That's you know. Preparation, preparation, rewriting the script, conversations, you know. So you'll show up with with reams of preparation and notes and lists and still something will go pear-shaped on the day that you couldn't possibly have predicted. But what what I've seen on movie sets where I've been acting Mm. is that you have this organic, living, breathing machine, which is your crew, and I'm, again, I'm talking about British crew members who are incredible, you know, 25 years in their in their chosen department as makeup or hair or costume or DP or or whatever it is. And everybody just knows that it's a pardon the expression, a kick bollock scramble. So you'll you'll everybody will pull together and make it work. And the clock is ticking or the sun is going down and we're losing the light or whatever it is. And everybody just pulls together in a perfect world because you cannot always predict however prepared you are that, 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 you know, you're, you're spending the money in the right way or something, you know, you get thrown a curveball and, you know, you're talking about say a cricket team where you've got to get an entire group. How many people are there in a cricket team? 11, 11, 11, 11, right. And then you have a couple on the side as standbys, right? Uh, Yeah. they're, They're substitutes. Very rarely do they ever play. But yeah. Bless the heart. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Well, let them play because they get fed up watching the other. Yeah, other they, kids. they bring the drinks. Anyway, out. so yeah, so so you you if you've got your team all, co- you know when there's one person in your team who's not got the mental connection mm. or you know they're not. I, in this rowing, I did rowing in a ladies' eight, and boy did we all bond as friends. Uh, just by rowing for a couple of hours on a Thursday morning, because when we were in that boat, that's all we had to do was pull together, literally pull together. Mm. And you've got your cocks and you've got your stroke. I love, I love rowing. (laughs) You've got, you know, you, you follow the girl in the front who's being told by the girl in front of her how to do it. And for that time, that's what you do. 
And, you know, professional sports people, professional film people, that's what they do. I would say to you, that's great with rowing. If you're rowing with a whole bunch of girls, that's fine. <laughs> Legs pull together. But you throw men into the mix there, it might not go so well. And there's potential that one of you, you might capsize. <laughs> it is, rowing is dangerous, apparently. <laughs> yeah. They say I put a I put a line in my film because one of my coaches said it once. He says there's two types of rowers: those that are falling in and those that are going to. <laughs> he might have a point there. Yes, especially <laughs> on the Thames because it's tidal, and one minute that you're one minute you're getting swept out to sea, and the next minute you've got you know a puddle to row yeah. in. Very bizarre. So, it's, yes, the sport, again, I can go on and on about this sporting analogy that you're yes. talking about. Mm. The expectations of, as you've said, the first boxing movie like this. First British boxing movie. Yeah, the vintage. Um, what does that feel like? The expectation of wanting to deliver and direct a movie. The boxing community, trust me, is not an easy community to crack. And when you do crack it, you have to be careful. Well, if I said, if I said, you know, from my conversations with champion boxers like Lennox or Barry McGuigan or Anthony Joshua or Darren Barker, they can taste it when they are ready to win. Yes. And I can taste it. I, I've i sat here and I, I'm just, in, you know, listening to you speaking, I'm like, I could sit here and talk about this all day long. But there gets a point where you get to sort of boiling point. Where and you want to like, just get out there and do it. Come on! Yeah. I go! So, does that answer your question? Yeah, good. I'm glad it does. I'm glad I've got you. I want all those blokes in the room. When you say, isn't that going to be challenging? Yes, of course it is. But how much fun is that challenge going to be? And the end of the day, when we look at what we've captured on film, we're going to use these HD cameras, you know, that they do these action replay, the slow-mo action. And it's just spectacular. It takes your breath away. The human eye can't see film in that, can't see real life in that way. And you slow it right down. One of my Twitter friends is um, Claire Balding, who I quote, I told her on Twitter this week, Claire, I quote you in my production meetings. Claire Balding during the Olympics said, the aesthetic of a sport is judged by, do I want to see that again in slow motion? And she was talking about the dressage. Yes. And, uh, you know, but you can apply that to, to definitely the boxing, the yes. swimming the water spraying, the, the the tennis as well. You know, it's just, it's so gorgeous. So even though I'm making a vintage period movie, I'm going to shoot it in a 21st century way with these cameras that we as a as sports, you know, sports fans, as people who watch, especially watch a lot of sport on TV, it's how we're used to watching that moment that the producer in the in the you know in the little video room chooses to replay that bit while the pundits are having their little say. You're going to get that in my film because why wouldn't I use the, that technology? It's it's the language of how we watch sport now. Mm. In terms of your Hollywood friends and people you have in Hollywood you've worked with, what's been their view on it? Richard Dreyfus said, um, "You'll make a smashing director, I imagine." <laughs> Just the very nice. nice. I've known him for like almost twenty years, so I'm like, Richard, I'm going to make a film. I'm going to direct it. He was like, "Oh yeah, you'll be fine." <laughs> well, if you believe me. Um, and then I, I, he's not, I can't call him a personal friend, but I did get to, uh, I went to see a screening of Argo uh, that Ben Affleck directed, of course. And he was there I, and I got to ask a question in the Q&A. And I specifically asked him the question about how did you make the transition between acting and directing? Because in the business, a lot of technical departments get invited to be directors, like editors or um, special effects guys. Um, you know, I guess they're perceived to be techie and, you know, more got the it's becoming more pop, more often it's happening. But let, you know, people don't, 
pick actors out and say, here, you have a go at directing this film. So he laughed at me. He said, they don't like editors direct. And I was like, well, yeah, they do at the BBC. It happens. Anyway, so <laughs> he was very, he goes, when he was a young actor, he was on a set with Warren Beatty, who was a huge, he was a huge, you know, idol of, of uh, Ben's. And he's like, I really, I just, you know, I, I want to be a director. How do I do that? And, um, uh, Warren Beatty, they were on a movie set. And Warren Beatty pointed at the director at the time. He said, you see that guy over there? Yeah. Well, if that asshole can do it, anybody can. Right? That, that's, <laughs> Meaning, yeah, I, I've heard that so many times and it's an right? inspiration for it, my own self. And so, so Ben Affleck looked back at me, he said, Alexandra, you know, and I'd worked with Brian Cranston, who was there as well. So Brian had made a giggle about an independent film we had been in. He said, Alexandra, you've worked with Brian Cranston, so you'll, you're clearly, you'll be fine. You're focused and determined. You've, you've, you've already done the baptism of fire working with Brian. But his point was, um, you know, it, it, you just have to do, if you want anything that's worthwhile, anything that has a smidgen of competition in it and elbowing other people out of the way, you've just got to keep at it. It's the not giving up part, isn't it? Absolutely. Better Fleck did also say, and of course it doesn't hurt having George Clooney as your executive producer, and no. I did say, would you give him my number? I'm still asking for George Clooney's number. <laughs> I haven't given it to him yet. So mean. So mean. Maybe after the success of the movie, George will pop along. Listen, you, at never a true word, you see. Once the no. film is made, I've already got my next film, screenplay, knocking about my head. You know, the second film, it, will be, it won't be easy. It will be easier to be, to oh, be no. introduced to the right people. Mighty. Yes, he gets to come. He can come. I'll send him a ticket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandria, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV. It has been a pleasure talking to you, learning Likewise. about the Hollywood life, the the you know the the life you're now li living in the UK, the wilderness. Obviously, the movie that's coming out in November 20, 2014. Yes. Um, Seems like ages away, but it's very clo it's closer than you think. It probably is closer than I think. And uh, like I said, I will do what I can from my end to... I appreciate that. I know in the boxing community. Should we, do, we, we need, do we need to say kickstarter.com? Just search the wilderness? Oh, hold me. I like to leave this last segment now coming in. All right. Before okay, I go end ahead. the interview, before I end, and I've said thank you to you anyway, before I end, yes. I'm going to say this. Um... How do we learn more about the movie? Apart from the fact that I'm going to be tweeting it anyway and put it in this video and all the rest of yeah, it. You're but, awesome. You're starting anyway. your own right. Okay, so the Kickstarter, where we're trying to, we just need 10, 10 bucks, 20 bucks from everybody within the sound of my voice. If you can hear my voice, a 20 buck pledge will um, we'll get you a thanks in the credits. Um, and you go to kickstarter.com and just search the wilderness. That's easy enough. It'll come right up. And then we have a Facebook page, which is Wilderness Movie. And that's after the, after the campaign ends on Sunday, um, we will have constant updates about where we are with the movie itself, the, the feature film, which is, the, the, um, which is Wilderness Movie on Facebook. Um, and we have a website, which is thewildernesscompany.uk.com. But the best place is probably Facebook. And then our Twitter is at Wilderness Movie. Alexandra, do you have your own Twitter account? Of course I do. Yes. Thank you, right? <laughs> That's the most yeah, important fact, thing. I just, I just upgraded to using my own voice. I was using a sort of, I didn't realize that Twitter really has to be about you. I was using this other sort of pseudonym that, you know, yeah, that's me. So I've just changed it to Alexandra Boyd UK is my Twitter name. Please follow that's, me. That's I feel funny. a bit lonely because I just started today. That's the one. Alexandra Boyd UK. Okay, and I'll do what I can to start hooking you up with uh, some people in boxing. I'm sure, maybe. Oh, I thought you were going to say George. Ah, <sighs> I'll give him a ring. I'll see if he will give you his number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alexandra, thank you so much for talking to Bayloric TV. Thank you. Thank you.